You are tuning into a podcast which inspires aspiring entrepreneurs, athletes, and people to follow their passion. My name is Urshad Ali, an athlete entrepreneur best known for being a professional natural physique athlete and a former world champ. And I'm sitting down with individuals to talk about their stories, the lessons they've learned, and how to make an impact. This is Stories with Urshad. So today on the show, we have the man, the myth, the legend. He is a very aggressive attacking center forward. He is a dad, he's an athlete, pro footballer, and a entrepreneur. Please welcome to the show, Kane Vincent. Thank you for having me. Cheers. What do you think about the intro, Kane? Oh, pop me up a bit there. <laughs> X-Pro, by the way. X-Pro? Yeah. My pro days are finished. Oh, X, X pro. Still, still playing, but yeah, pro. Yeah, that's X pro. X pro. Yeah. I mean, you're back in New Zealand now. You've played a lot of football. By the way, Kane's played for over ten clubs. Is that safe to say? Yeah, I mean, definitely fifteen. Definitely over ten. Yeah, hundred percent. It's like a club, a club a season. Yeah, so I was lucky enough to play maybe in four different countries. Yeah, over the span of fourteen years, I think in total. 14 years four country, in four country, four different countries. Yeah, I played in Japan, India, Thailand, Malaysia. Yeah, four. Professionally, yeah. And then I played a little bit in um, Australia in the, what do you call it, State League, just in the off-season, just to keep fit and stuff like that. Yeah. And you're back in New Zealand now? Yeah. Playing at Western Spring currently at the time of recording this podcast? Yep, Western Springs. Um, yeah, just to keep fit and... I guess it's hard to walk away fully. So yeah, yeah. Western Springs reached out and having a good time there. So that's still keeping the dream alive. <laughs> still keeping the dream alive. Man. <laughs> what if you get a call up now? So say tomorrow uh, you get a call up from overseas or something. Hey, um, Kane, we'd like you to come back and, uh, you know, just half the season. Yeah. So that actually still happens. And I always turn it down. Just uh, my position in life's changed. Right, so like now I've got three kids, they're comfortable here, they're in school, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I can't be too selfish and, you know, keep moving them just just for me, like, you know what I mean? And I'm not the player that I used to be either, so it'd be unfair for the club as well. Like, you know what I mean? Like they might yeah. be looking at some videos and stuff, but that's that's old stuff now. Yeah. So they won't be getting the same player and I couldn't really do that either, so... I see. So interesting you say that, like how you'd always have to move the family l- around mm. when when you were playing for the time that you played overseas. So every time you moved, did yep. the family move with you? Yeah, so my family's still young. Like my oldest is seven now. Yep. So like when I was in Thailand, he was born and actually had two of them in Thailand with me. And then uh, we came back for the birth of my third. Um, and then that's kind of when COVID hit. And then I went back to play. My wife stayed here with three kids under five. Yeah. And we, we just got stuck. So, like, she couldn't come over. I couldn't come back. And we ended up spending the year apart. And um, that's when it got kind of, like, too hard. I see. Yeah, especially for her. And, like, fair enough. So she kind of asked me, like, yo, when's that time to, like, call a quit? So that's kind of, like, the main reason I came back. Yeah. Yeah. I see. So if COVID didn't happen... Do you think you'd be still pushing and playing overseas? Um, I always had a number in my head, like uh, 33, 34, maybe, yeah, that, yeah, that's enough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely, I'd, I'd still be playing, I think, yeah. overseas. Yeah. I mean, when you're in that environment as well, it's I wouldn't be how I am today, you know what I mean? Like when, when I'm playing here in New Zealand in the Springs, like – I've kind of adapted to the level here. So yep. I'm not training as hard. I'm not training as much. Like I'm not looking after myself as I would in a pro environment. Yeah. As bad as that sounds. <laughs> but, um, you know what I mean? Like being in a, that pro environment just forces you to live better or you know, prepare yeah, yeah, better. Because yeah. I, I actually like, you know, me, I come from like a health and fitness background sort of thing. Um, I, the way me and you obviously connected was, you know, Chris asked me to come speak to the team at Western Springs. I did. Uh, that's how me and you connected. And hence, you know, I, I reached out to you and I said, would you like to come on the podcast? And thank you for saying yes and being here and sharing your story today. Um, with being at Western Springs, when I was actually there, I was surprised that you guys had pizza for like dinner with the team. 
when Chris said that, oh, there's a team meal, we're going to get together. Um, and then Pizza and some of the some of the guys were having beers as well. Yeah. I was one of them, eh? Yes, I was like, <laughs> wow, like, you know, I, I thought com- something completely different. I'm like, okay, these guys don't have proper, like, maybe protein, carb, vegetables, and... No, nah, no, nah, so... Yeah, so obviously, because it's amateur here. Yeah. Like, the level's amateur. Like, the thinking's amateur as well. Like, it's just different, you know? Like, you're not getting paid like pro. You're not training like a professional player. Like, you know what I mean? So there's yeah. limits. And I think that diet stuff you got to kind of do yourself if you really want to peak or yeah. reach a certain level. Um, but that thinking or that like, mentality is not really drilled in here. So what were, you, what were you doing then when you were coming up? Say you were 16, 17, 18. Obviously, you had a dream to play pro football. Yeah. You had a dream to make it um, to the international stage. How were you looking after yourself when you look at the, the younger kids now today? Did you have anything specific that you did that gave you the edge? Um, not on diet-wise. I just ate what I wanted. I was, I was young, you know what I mean? Like, you don't really care about that. But, like, I trained hard. Yeah. And I think that was my difference, like, I think, um, I don't know, growing up I wasn't like uh, top of the pack or anything like that. I was kind of like not average, but I was I was good. Like, you know what I mean? But there were so many other better players. Yeah. So I was one of the lucky few that actually got out and actually made a career out of football. Um, but it wasn't until like my second to last year at high school, I was just an average player in the first 11. And then the last year of high school, I kind of I changed. You know, like I went to the gym three times a week before school. Um, that massively helped me, like yeah. the growing body, and I just got stronger, faster. Um, yeah, and just that dedication to get up and do extra while the other players or other kids are sleeping. Yeah. I mean, um, school training, club training was only twice a week, so you still had three other nights to do something, and I'd always be out, like either running or kicking a ball, and you know, down the uh, down the road, or just. Cause I knew no one else was, or not no one else, but like the majority weren't. Yeah, you know. So that's I think how I got my edge, and I did really well in my last year at football uh, at school, and I took advantage of my Japanese passport and uh, went for a f- couple trials um, in Japan. I and see, ho- and it all worked out. So. And what like how old were you when you went for that? Like straight after high school, or was it during high school? Uh, during high school, I think that. Last school holidays before you're supposed to be studying for the final exams. Yep. I went to Japan for two weeks and did my trials then. And then, um, did you still do the exam? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you I, still, I okay. did all that, but yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, so obviously, I did my trials then and just studied like over there. Um, but then after school, I got selected for the under 20s. Um, and I think that was a real boost for the pro clubs in Japan to kind of like take me more seriously. And I think that's when I got my contract. Yeah. Um, cause the club I ended up signing for Cirrus, so they, they really, um, nurture the like youth, like they, they love that, you know what I mean? So like in that team, that first team squad, I think they had about four or five under 20 Japanese players that were going to the under 20 world cup. And then I was in contention of going to the under 20 world cup with New Zealand cause we just qualified as well. Yeah. So I think that kind of like made them go, yeah, we'll take you. So that was my break. So that was that was really good. But I think, yeah, like I think I just trained harder than anyone else. So you did answer your question. Yeah. So you did the extra things um, that other people, or majority of the people that don't do that. So you put in the extra training. Um, you you went harder at the sessions. A lot of the people are there to just literally kick a ball around. Mm. They're not there to actually train and improve. So you did all the things and you did your own stuff as well on top of that. Yeah, and it's not really their fault. Like, it's, it's no one's fault. It's just not available. Um, that dream isn't really available here. Like, it is, say, in Europe and stuff like that. Like, that pathway to become a pro, it's not It's not there. You know what I mean? Like yeah. For football, only, it's not here. No, in these yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. there's only one pro team, which is the Phoenix, or you've got... Um, the National League now, and that's the highest league. That's yeah. that's the highest you can go unless you actually go overseas, right? So even even to go overseas is really difficult. You need connections, you need passports, or whatever, and you need to be at a certain level. So just because that um, the pathway isn't there, you know, the kids aren't driven or 
Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, to, to do what they... That's why I think, remember, when I came that night, I asked people why... Well, ask the players over there that why did you pick football as your main sport? Everybody had a, such a different, unique answer to why they picked football. Yeah, and the main reason is they love it, right? Yeah. But they don't do that extra because what's the point? What's like, the point? Like, it's not, they don't have to. Yeah. And it's always, um, I guess. just do the bare minimum and get away with it and play and enjoy. And that's, that's the life of a footballer in New Zealand. In New Zealand. Because most of the funding, most <sighs> of the um, focus, I guess, is on rugby. Um, which obviously you know New Zealand does really well at, and also cricket as well. I guess those would be the top two, and you know they do fairly well at that. And I don't think like New Zealand lack talent. I think what you said is hundred percent bang on. It's just the pathways that are not in place for football in New Zealand that is for other you know those two other sports, cricket and, and rugby. Yeah, and just to touch on that, like there is a lot of talent here. Yeah, like I said, I was I wasn't the best in my age or anything. I was just lucky. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of talent here, but it's it's not all about talent. It's about mentality as well. Yeah. And I think that's where I was really strong. like, And that's probably why I lasted so long as well in the uh, pro game. Um, you can just see like kids are so good here, but just weak. Yeah. Like mentally. Like just uh, they go into a shell or they don't step up or don't want to do the extra because it's hard. You know, yeah. like that sort of stuff. Like, and if you really do want to go pro or you want, you're serious about going pro, you need both. You know what I mean? So yeah. sometimes even mentality over talent. And you see a lot of um, young players here who get that opportunity to go pro and they come straight back after a few months. Like, why? Not because they're not good enough, but also maybe mentally, mentally it's not there, you know? Because yeah. that's what I think – in any sport, sort of, that's what makes what makes a good performer, a good player, right? Mm. Is that they get a, you got to have your mental in place. You got to have your talent, obviously, that's there. But it's a combination of both of them that comes together to making you the player. And I think you're hundred percent right on saying that that you had the mental part sorted. You're a good player, but there were players that were better than you, but they probably didn't have the mental thing because that's the thing that gets you the, you know, gets you to the level that you obviously went to. And then obviously there's players that um, keep playing here, although they're so talented, but they don't see themselves playing overseas. Wh why do you think that is though? Like they're so good, they do well here, they get stuck in playing here, even the opportunity comes, but they never take it. It's not the players that they go and come back. It's players that they never take the opportunity. They're like, in their minds, everybody is so much better than them. I've seen this too, but they don't realize how good they actually are. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know because like, I don't really like speaking for other people. Yeah. But I'm kind of starting to see a pattern since I've been back and it's this whole, like, it's all about fun. You know what I mean? Like it's, I struggle with that because I don't know, even even when I came to Springs and like this is where I really feel for Zorro, like our coach. Um, yeah how he's trying to like set up these training drills and like training sessions and he's going to have an element of fun to it. Otherwise players won't like it or don't want to stay. They might go to another club where they have more fun. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But that's where that amateur like, mindset is like, so it's hard and I can s even, it's a bit harsh, but like my, my oldest is seven and he's starting to play football now, but he's not learning anything. Like it's all about fun. So he's playing all these games, like fun games. Yeah. It's not improving him as a player, you know, like you can still do the technical side, get all that sorted while having fun, but it's too much fun. You know what I mean? It's too yeah. much that way. So when yeah. they get older, they don't have the basics, yeah, you know? and then they can't perform to a certain level or they can't do certain things. Yep. And then when they get older and older and older, it's it's all about like, oh, fine, it doesn't really matter if we lose or win, you know, like, but sure, you get those certain individuals who are like, I have to win. Like, you know, that's just, like, in them. Yeah. But I think the majority it just falls under that category. I don't know. It's, and it's quite frustrating because then, like, someone like me, I've come I've come back into this environment and then it starts to rub off on me, you know, and it's kind of like, oh, like, okay, if you don't care, then yeah, why should I? Like, yeah, but it's a little bit different for me because I've done it. I've 
been there, done that. Yeah. So it's kind of like a relaxing, not relaxing, but like a cool down period for me yeah. in my career. I'm not trying to go anywhere. I'm just trying to just keep playing, keep the body fit. I see. But and you, yeah, you, you said your eldest is um, seven now, and, and he's ch- starting to obviously get into football and everything. Is that what you sort of see your kids? You, you, you would like your kids to be involved in football, or is it something because they've seen you obviously ever since they've been around to what they understand because they see, oh, dad does that and that seems to be fun. I'm going to do that, but they don't actually obviously at this age understand what you've gone through to. Yeah, to, but they don't need to understand. Yeah. That, so, so do you want them to play like football? Don't get me wrong. Like it needs to be fun. Otherwise yeah. you don't carry on. Yeah. But yeah. So I don't know before I had my kids, I was kind of like, yeah, sweet. Like, yeah, he's going to be a footballer. Like, you know, oh, that's right. what you kind of yeah, think yeah, about. Yeah. Right. But then once you have them and then like every kid's different. Yeah. Right. So I'm not forcing him to play. Yeah. If he wants to play, he can play. And if I'll support him or, you know, help him in any way possible, yeah. like he'd, he'd have a pretty good teacher, yeah. you know, but, um, it's more of the life's lessons that I want to teach him, like, you know, that desire or like just consistent, being consistent. Like the principles you, you know what I mean? Like, like that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but if he doesn't want to play football, that, that's then, fine with me. That's, that's fine. That's good. Um, well, it's good that he's got an early interest in football. And, yeah, definitely. Uh, oh, yeah. it makes me happy. Yeah, Don't yeah, get me wrong. Like I, I do enjoy going to, on Saturdays and watching him play and like, yeah. you know, and he's improving. Like when he first played, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> You know, like it's not going to happen. But, but, but he's but only he, seven. Exactly. So, yeah. so like he's he's getting a lot better. Like I think he started last year at six and then yeah, he's got a lot, lot better in that one year. So let's see where it goes. But Nice. Yeah. So w- what would you, like if there's that one advice that you'd give to like youngsters, like that are 16, 17, 18, you know, if that's the stage, I guess, people either dream big or they kind of deviate from the thing and they've gone to university or do something else after they leave high school. What's that one like advice that you'd give them now to kind of set them on the right path? It's for you. It's not for you. You got to do this. Or what do you think? What would be that one thing that you tell them? If someone came, hey, Kane, tell me what I need to do to go overseas and play pro football. I think like don't give up on your dream. Like you got to protect your dream, right? But you got to do everything you can to like make that dream come true, right? So... It's a hard one for me. Like, I just trained hard and then whatever happened, happened. Like, if I never got those pro contracts, I would have just gone to uni like everyone else. Yeah. But because I held on to that dream and I did everything to make that happen, it worked out, which is great. Um, but you you got to do more than what you're doing. That's one thing for sure. Like, if you're doing two nights a week, that's not, that's not enough. You yeah. can't underestimate what other kids are doing or what other players are doing overseas because it's ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like... Yeah. You must got to get out of comfort zone, like do it, right? So like I was training every day. I was training f- like whether it was by myself or in a team environment, five nights a week and then I'd have school football, club football on the weekends. Um, yeah, just protect your dream and go for it really. What's YOLO? <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? You only yeah. live once. So. Really, really nothing to lose. Yeah, just no um, regrets really. If you no give it a regrets. good crack and it's not enough, then – at least you can walk away from life. I gave it everything. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people give up too soon, like, because you don't know when that next door opens, right? So you only live once. I agree what you said. And also the other thing is that when you look back, no regrets. I think regret is one of the biggest killers in life. Like if five years pass, 10 years pass, and you look back, so damn, I was really good at football. If I only did what Kane did, you know, maybe – then just maybe I could have been there or even, you know, better. I think a lot of people, like, just they just don't stay in it long enough. Like, how long did you give yourself in your mind or on your plan that, okay, I'm going to give myself this many years. If it doesn't work out for me, then um, I have to look at something else. Was Did you have, like, a set no, I, I, time frame? No, I never had that because I, I didn't want to. I guess like, yep. but but lucky for me, I kept getting contracts. So like, I never, I was never in a position where I'm like, oh, uh, maybe I got to think about something else. Right. Okay. Don't get me wrong. When I got older, I did start thinking about that, just because like, what am I going to do after football? But that's kind of different. Yeah. Um, you could just yeah. So towards the end of my career, I was starting to prepare myself for after football. 
Um, Which is, how does after football now, since you come back, you're playing um, not pro football, uh, if, although you're playing at a top level in New Zealand, um, what, how does after football sort of look like for you now? Like what's what's in the in the plans for you, like as a footballer, pro footballer, ex-pro footballer, like what, what does it look like? I think people always wonder this question though. They're like, okay, if I get into pro, pro sport, what I do after? Because I've had other friends as well, they're into pro sports and things. And a lot of them, they sort of, obviously they can't play sport anymore. They haven't really done anything else. Mm. Um, they do end up financially well, but I think it kind of hurts them uh, in the mental well-being part of it as where well. they actually don't know what to do. And they're not around people like that anymore because they're not in the environment. Not unless obviously you go to become a coach or something like that. So what does it look like for you now, like say for the next five years? Um, so just to touch on that, like I really struggled, like, Maybe only this year. I've, I, I struggled for a year since I, when I got back. It was just a like culture shock, almost. You know, like I was kind of like, "Oh my god, what am I doing? Like, what do I do now?" And mentally, that was really, really hard. Um, just because, yeah, like that's all you knew, right? And then it changes, and now you've got like the rest of your life, and you're kind of like, "Oh, I can't do what I used to do," and you know. So, yeah, just that transition was really, really tough. So I'm okay now, um, but. Yeah, I've got to thank my th family for that, really. Like, my kids, now they're, they're my life now, and yeah. my wife. So uh, my main focus is, is more for them. Um, so there's a lot of different tiers in, like, pro football, right? So, like, you've got, like, your top leagues, like Premier League and stuff. And if you do play well, do, sorry, you do well there and you play well there, then, yeah, probably you can, like, live on your football money for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, but like in the tier I was at, like you can make really good money. I still know players or ex-teammates that could probably still live like without working. Yeah. You know, it depends the how they manage the money. Yeah. yeah. But you can't be dumb. Like you can't just think that when you start a career and be like, yeah, I'm going to make so much money that I'm not going to work. You know, like you ask any pro footballer who just starts, they don't want to work after football. That's why I don't think about it. You know what I mean? Like, so when they do hit 30, they might not be financially, like, in that position and then they panic and then, you know what I mean? So I I was lucky enough to kind of just start thinking, like, okay, what am I going to do after football? And, and when did you start thinking that? How for, for to be fair, I was, I was always thinking that. Always thinking that. Yeah. Yeah. Not, like, change careers. Just yeah. what about after football? Just because I, I observe, right, so... When I first started, I was watching the senior players, you know, like, were they financially good or what are they going to do after or, like, you know, like, and, you know, and then... So we started observing very early on. Yeah, and even, like, the mid-20s or close to 30s, what are you going to do after football? You know, like, I just asked questions and, like, yeah. I was like, I do not want to be in the position he's in, you know, like, yeah. so I started thinking like that. And so I was always thinking, like, what am I going to do after? Um, but I'm, I'm just... I'm kind of enjoying this transition period now that my head's screwed on now. Like, I'm just enjoying the kids. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, because when I was playing, although you get a lot of downtime, like it's still me, me, me. But now I don't have that. I can just kind of focus now on my family, which is kind of refreshing. Yeah. Because they've always been there for me in my career and let me do what I want. Yes. So it's kind of nice to pay back that favor. Yeah, and my wife's a perfect example. Like she stopped her career or put on pause so I could do my thing. So like that's also another main reason why I stopped. So I always I always knew I was going to do this, but like I stopped my football so now she can kick on and like you guys switch roles yeah, now. Yeah. So she's doing the thing and, and you I'm look after to, the kids. I'm there to support. Right. Nice, nice. I like that. Yeah. So, I mean, you've started your. Clothing, so clothing brand as well, which is uh, Offside yeah. Apparel. And uh, you started that a couple of years ago, you were saying? Um, uh, yeah, so I started that four years ago. Four years ago, a few years ago now, yeah. Yeah, so, um, but that was just a hobby. It wasn't It wasn't like, a, oh yeah, I'm going to do clothing for like, after football for the rest of my life. Like yep. that, was, that was more of a hobby that me and my mate, who's still playing actually, um, we just had a chat, like, we're like, oh, we just got sick of buying crap clothes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like T-shirts or they don't fit quite right or like after a few washes, they're just 
crap out or, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, so we're like, oh, let's just start making our own, yeah. you know? So we thought with the amount of exposure we could get as football players, like we knew all the Thai national team players, like we played them, right? So we're like, oh, we'll just chuck them on all those guys. And then we just started using our football connections and we roped in some pretty big players. Like um, we got Bellatelli, Aaron Ramsey. Yeah. Yeri Mina, Richarlison, um, my friend Kagawa Shinji, like just, you know, like through friends and contacts like that, we just sent out shirts and they they all love them and wear them all the time. So yeah. massive compliment. And then it almost got to the point where like, oh, we can't really stop. So it's just yeah. kind of kicked on. So it's been about four years now. Four years now and going strong. Yeah. Going yeah. strong. That's good. Offside, it's it's a very, very cool name, man. Uh, how did you come up with that name or who came up with it? Um it's quite funny, like, me and my mate, we were, like, at a night out in a club, and we kind of had this, like, deep and meaningful, like, oh, what are we going to do after football kind of thing like this, and uh, we we're pretty intoxicated. <laughs> and anyway, we were like, oh, let's meet up for a coffee tomorrow. And to be fun, uh, to be fair, like, we both turned up, you know, in a hangover state, and we had a we had a coffee over it, and um, I don't know, we're just there, like, coming up, trying to come up with a name, and, like, just getting rattled about this name, you know. And then as a joke, I kind of said, like, well, what about offside? Because it was offside. Like, he's a striker as well. <laughs> yeah. And then it, it's to the point where, like, a name doesn't really matter. And this is, like, advice for, like, anyone trying to start up a brand or a clothing label or whatever. Like, it's not the name. Like, it's what you do with the name. You know what I mean? It's more the having the good product, like, and just advertising it and, you know, getting yeah. it sold. Like, there's some crazy names out there that make no sense or like they're not good, but they do well, yeah. right? So That's don't it. get too caught up on the name because it'll so click later. So you guys pretty much came up with a name, semi hungover, yeah. And then it was just like we already we always, the whole business hungover. <laughs> and it's some sometimes like some things like that come off and they just like work out to be really good. And four years in, it seems to be going pretty well. And, yeah, can't complain. It's, and what's what's the next step for Offside now? What do you guys plan on doing with that brand now? Um, so Offside was mainly football. Yeah. Like football, apparel, streetwear, stuff. Um, but now I'm back here. I've moved the brand to New Zealand. And because football is kind of really small here, um, we're kind of thinking about a little rebrand where it's not just football, but it's like, caters to like sports so like more athletes so yeah. it's kind of like the motto is like uh you'll get off the pitch so it could re relate to anyone rugby players cricketers whatever yeah um so i think we're going to go down that path and then bring in more like track suits and just so i think our space in the market would be more you know you got your adidas and nikes right like your sports wear kind of but you can't really wear that shirt to, like I say, a dinner. You know, like a like Adidas or a Nike logo. It's, it's too cash, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we want to kind of it's a bit be too that. sporty. Yeah, we yeah. want to be like in that um, space where we do exactly what Nike and Adidas can do. But like, you can also wear our gear out or, you know, it still look smart and cash. And, oh, no, yes. Sorry, it still look like smart and like decent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, without having that too casual look. Yeah. So you guys are gonna introduce like um, shirts and like shirts as well, and yeah. that and that line, or is I mean, it like dress shirts? Yeah. Nah, probably not. Not that. Not that <laughs> formal. Okay. Nah, that's too formal. That's too formal. Yeah. So we got everything from like fitted. We started off with the fitted tee, and that does really well. Um, say in Europe and Asia, and not so much here. Surprisingly, I yeah. thought I thought it would do all right, but the New Zealand. Now we've got to cater to kind of New Zealand because we're here. So it's more the baggy, the oversized stuff. So we do have oversized tees now. And, yeah, it's a hit here. And then... The oversized tees are a hit. Yeah. So Zealand. our oversized tees are a bit different to, say, a normal oversized tee. Like, we use a thicker fabric. Um, so it just fits and sits better as well. Yeah. And the quality's good, so it lasts. Um, so we're, we're really... Uh, quality kind of mind it. It's got to be good quality. Yeah. You know? So who tests all your stuff? Like how do you, what determines this is, like, you know, this is good quality? Me. <laughs> you, you test everything? Yeah, I pretty much do everything. Yeah. You yeah. do the quality control pretty much. It has to be. Yeah, design, like everything. Has to be up to cane quality. <laughs> 
you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's no. just say I spend enough money on clothes to kind of to kind of know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's good, man. So the brand's going to um, start making products or um, you know clothing to the New Zealand market, which you guys already started. Oversized tees are a big hit in New Zealand. Um, and where can they buy your offside apparel from? Uh, yeah. So we got we've got a website, um, which is offside offside. I think. Well, we'll see. Well, let's have a look at. Offside Dakota, isn't it? You offside, think? Offside NZ. Do- do- Sorry, we had, that was the old one. When we're overseas, yeah. So for the listeners, it is offside.com, NZ. actually. Offside NZ.com. Offside NZ.com. And um, who's, who's that on the cover? Oh, it's just a footballer in Thailand. Right. Oh, well, there you go. The man himself. And um, so where are these, do you guys have the oversized tees on, on the uh, website? Yep. yep. It should be, yeah, that yellow one. The yellow ones. Well, for the listeners that are, they can't view the video version of it, we're looking at the offside oversized tees on the website, which is offsitenz.com. And they have some yellow colors, red Black and white, which is looks pretty primo. I quite like the blacks. Blue. Blue is sort of my... I dig the blue too. Nice. So if you guys want to check it out, go check them out. Um, they look pretty cool. And they come in multiple different colors. Red. Is that a purple maybe? A purple, right? Like off? Yeah, so we got rose. Uh, yeah, purple, lilac. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been fun. Like we're learning as we go, and no, it's been good. It's, it's it's really like complimented when you see like big stars wearing it as well. Like, yeah, because these guys are on millions and millions of dollars. They can buy whatever they want. Yeah, and they wear our stuff, so it's no, nice. it's really good. And like, what is that apart from your clothing brand? And now you kind of like, you know, like tapering off with the football. Um, what is that one thing sort of that's like that you quite intrigued on that's happening out there at the moment or happening in your life that you want to learn more about and like, you know, like what is this, a certain area in your life that you want to grow in and that you feel it's important that you do that? Um, I don't know. Now I've got time. I do really want to like dig into offside. Yeah. So more offside um, stuff. Just because while I was playing, obviously offside was really part time. It was just a hobby. Like I said, so now I don't have football. Like I can really give it my attention. Yeah. Um, that um, I'm also doing a bit of coaching at the moment, which is quite satisfying to be fair, because I get to give back to football. Yeah. So that is kids coaching. Yeah. So kids coaching. at the moment, I take the under 15s um, with a teammate of mine, Josh. Uh, we we do the under 15s at Western Springs, and yep. um, it's been really fun. To be fair, like you know, we take them in. Um, we we train twice a week. Yeah. Do tactics, formations, and you know, like patterns and all that stuff. And then we see it come to life in the weekend. If it doesn't work, then we go back to the drawing board. You know, like that sort yeah. of stuff. It's real fun. So, um, uh, so you guys are like coaches of the under fifteen team. Yeah. Right. I see. So how does that like go with your guys' schedule in terms of? Training and you guys play on the weekends too, right? So they play on the yeah. So basically, I coach them and then I've got my training straight after. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you drill them, then Chris drills you guys. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so Josh, Josh is the also at Western Spring. The you, you guys new captain, is it? Yeah, yeah. That's new Josh. captain. Oh, all right, that's Josh. Yeah, that guy. That guy seems pretty switched on. I yeah, remember. we we work well together. Like he's really good at say delivering. Like he's. Like really good with words and he, he can deliver a really good session and yeah. then I just come in with say my knowledge and experience and like just more detail like I can take a player to a side and like improve him individually and basically just give Josh some drills that I've I've done in the past you know yeah. that, that can help the team and so yeah we together we work pretty well together, I see. Yeah. so do you see yourself doing that sort of long term into the future maybe that becomes like a full-time thing and alongside with offside yeah. or not really? Yeah, I don't know yet. 
And you don't know. Yet. I don't know yet. I mean, um, you do enjoy it, so. Yeah, I don't really want to commit to anything like now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I just finished a massive commitment. So yeah, I'm kind of, like I said, I'm kind of enjoying the downtime and just being with the kids and family at the moment. Nice. Just, yeah. And um, apart from Offside, um, the clothing clothing line and your football stuff, do you, do you invest elsewhere? Like are you into property investment? Are you into stocks? Are you into crypto? Yeah, uh, yep. So... Um, I was 23 when I bought my first house. Um, and then we sold that. Congrats. Like, sorry? Congrats. Yeah. So yeah, I was doing, I was doing pretty well. So yeah. we bought that, um, in Onihanga and then uh, we sold that and now we're out in Hobsonville Point. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I've got a whole bunch of shares. Nice. Yeah. So I, yeah. What, what's the, what's the top, um, like the US share market or? No, nah, I just, I deal with. I did all that. Like yeah. I played around with all the US share markets and stuff like that, but nothing much was happening. So I kind of just, um, I, it was actually the New Zealand shares that were doing well for me. So I kind of sold all the US and yeah. just, just invested all into the New Zealand share market. Yeah. The COVID time was an interesting time for shares, wasn't it? Like yeah. everything, like people made money, made bank then. Yeah. If you did it smartly, that is. And then a lot of people lost money too, obviously. that Yeah, if you invest in the right companies, yeah. like you could have yeah. done right. That was a good time too. I remember that. Nathan, yeah. did you did you invest in anything? Nathan, it was, it was a good time. Yeah, I, did a, I did a bit of that then as well um, in the share market. With the world going to digital and everything nowadays, a lot of people even like crypto. Have you like tried your hand at crypto? Nah, I don't understand it. Eh? Don't, yeah. don't really want to either. I just, I'm happy with the shares. Happy with the shares. Yeah, that's good. Keep it simple. What you nah, understand? Don't, yeah, yeah, don't get too greedy. Yeah, that's where you make mistakes, and I've made a fair share of mistakes <laughs> in, <laughs> with investments. Yeah. I mean, that's the only way you get to the good ones, right? When you make mistakes yeah. on the shitty ones, that's how you get to the good ones, I guess. Yeah, here's a funny one. So, like, I was in Malaysia and I was making decent money, and I was like, "Oh yeah, sweet, let's let's invest in something." <laughs> and an ex teammate of mine, also an ex Arsenal player, um, he was like, "Oh." We're investing in this like vodka company. So he's like, you want to come on board and be like a shareholder in the vodka? And I was like, what's the vodka? And he goes, Zing Vodka. And it's legit, right? So I don't know if you if you want to pull up the- um, Zing Vodka. No, no, don't type in Zing. Go to YouTube oh, and right. type in uh, Chris Brown Loyal. Chris Brown endorsed this? Yeah, that, that video clip. Yeah, so this was the thing, right? Like Chris Brown, like Kid Ink, they were all in the, the Zen Vodka. And then, so I was like, yes, yeah, sweet, take my money, right? So, yeah. oh, I, I don't know, like, I probably got robbed a bit, but like, yeah, it was, um, I think I invested like 50K. You know? Into Zing yeah. Vodka. But, no, is, sorry, is, I, is, I invested a little bit into Zing and then it changed to like, they go, now, nah, people at Zing are like pretty difficult to work with but yeah. we know all the information we can start making our own vodka okay that is interesting so there were shareholders in the thing as well did it even go on to become a thing or not really yeah it was actually a legit like vodka brand apparently. Uh, it's coming up I see seeing vodka oh, I see subtle branding in the background so what what where is that at now? So what ended up happening? Well, I think Zing went bust. Yeah. Right. Um, but I think it was heading that way. So the guys I was involved in, they were like, let's make our own. Right. So then he had all the connections to get it all done. And it was actually happening. Um, and so like I own 10% of this company instead of like something. I Sorry. I, I own 10% of worldwide distribution for this new vodka company instead of like 10% of Zing in just Germany or something like that. Yeah. Uh, it was a long time ago. Um, I don't know. And then like the main dude fell ill or whatever. I, I don't know what happened, but like it just stopped. And yeah, and, like never saw my money again. <laughs> so what, what, what got you to the stage to be convinced enough to actually give them the money? Like what convinced you to give them the money? Like was it the pitch? Was it? Nah, it wasn't. It wasn't even the pitch. It was just, just being young. I think like 
You know, just like. How old like, were you at that time? I was probably 24, 25. 24, 25. I mean, not that young, but like yeah. I was, I don't know, maybe that going back to like after football thing, uh, I okay. thought like if I had 10% of a alcohol company, I did my research, you know, yeah. like alcohol's massive. Yeah. You know, and vodka's massive, like the revenue it makes. I was like, if I can own 10% of a chunk of that, like, you know, wouldn't have to work again, right? Yeah. And free vodka for the rest of my life. <laughs> I don't drink vodka anymore. <laughs> As a bad experience. A bad experience. <laughs> so um, what would you have done differently then? Like say, say in this investment, like if you could go I back. I wouldn't have missed. So you wouldn't have invested at all? No. Nah. If, if that's, is it because what you know now or is it like. Or just how it happened. Just how it happened. Yeah. Yeah, I see. I wouldn't have done that. I would have invested in something else. Maybe the share market. That's probably would have been the safe bit. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, and um, with with every, like going back to my other point, with everything going digital and everything like that, with obviously offside, um, you guys obviously, obviously run ads online. Like I said, I'm like, man, when I came to that uh, that talk that I did at Western Springs, I'm like, man, I've seen this guy somewhere before. I was like looking at Jim, like I've seen him somewhere. I can't, I couldn't put my finger on it until you said uh, the offside of Pharaoh. I'm like, ah, okay. So I've seen those ads pop up because obviously – I'm probably in within the targeting of the people that would potentially wear the clothing, right? Yeah. So that's how I've seen the ads. So how does it work out now with your own personal branding? Like, because um, you were obviously by the looks of it a lot more active on social media before um, for your personal stuff. Yeah. It, so it, I don't know. I, I hardly ever do anything to my personal Instagram anymore. Yeah. I mean, oh, there's your son. Yeah, one of them. <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, when I was when I was playing, it would be like constant, just posting. Yeah, obviously. So, how do you feel about that now? Well, when the world's going even into more digital, and um, you're coming sort of coming offline, um, what's the what's the plan for your personal brand? Like, as in Kane Vincent, like going online. What would you like to do moving forward with your personal brand? To be honest, like this doesn't, it doesn't bother me, yeah, anymore. Like, yeah, back when I was playing, like there was an image or people wanted to know, yeah. But it's like that saying, like you know, like no one cares after, yeah. like you know what I mean. Like yeah. so, now I'm finished. Like they've all forgotten about me. Yeah. Do you reckon? But I mean, you you're still getting calls for for you to come oh, out and play. But you know what I mean. Like, yeah. Not like like it was. Yeah. Um. But yeah, doesn't bother me at all. Like that's past lifetime almost. Yeah, fair enough. And looking at this football, you know, football photos and everything. Oh, there you are. You got the Nike. Uh, you're playing in the Superflies. Yeah, those safaris. Yeah. yeah. They, oh, they're vapors. Yeah. Oh, you you did like your Nikes, didn't you? Those are classics now. When was that photo taken? What club is that? That would have been 20, 2020 or 2019. Uh -huh. 2019, so not too long ago. Oh, no, 2020. 20, oh, yeah, 2020 uploaded. But I see. Now, you love those Safari. Were they, were they the CI7 edition? Yeah. Oh, nice, nice. I remember asking the question back at Western Springs, CI7 or Missy? You said CI7, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, good man, good man. Yeah, I'm a CI7 guy as well. Why CI7, though? Um, I don't know. I reckon the the question we're gonna get Messi, a lot of hate for this, but yeah, why CI seven? Uh, so like, I can explain. So like, I reckon the question like Messi or Ronaldo, like yeah. it's a sort of it's just dumb question. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. they're both unbelievable, right? One hundred percent. Don't get me wrong. Like, if you say who's the better footballer, I reckon Messi is a better footballer. But I think the question is like, who would you rather have in your team? Right. I think that should be the question and. For me, Ronaldo is in my team over Messi. Just because <laughs> I don't know, like he's a finisher, right? So the hardest thing in football is to score, they say, right? And that's why they get paid the most. And yet R Messi can create, but if you don't have like world class players around you who can finish the, what you create, you got nothing. Like if you look at Ronaldo's season at Man United, that's that's like a it's washed up Ronaldo, right? He's like he's 37 and he's still playing at the highest level yeah. and he scored 20-odd goals for United. 
But if you ever look at like his highlights, he could have had double figures or almost 20 assists if yeah. players around him could finish. Yeah. Right? 100%. So if, if players around you finished, like he'd be unreal, you know? Yeah. Like, I think 28 goals he scored. Yeah. I think, yeah, 28 goals. At 37. Yeah. You know, for a not so great Man United team in the Premier League, still scoring hat tricks and stuff, and then yeah. Messi only scored what five for PSG and the yeah. French league. You know, that's why like he's got right, left foot, free kicks, headers, yeah. unreal headers. You know, penalties. What he can score. He is the most potent finisher in the game. Like even still at this age. Yeah. But United couldn't give him the ball, right? And then they they criticise his defending or pressing or he's the problem but if he played for say Chelsea with like Reese James just whipping in crosses he would have got on the end of like half of those and would have had like 30 goals that season yeah. you know what I mean so it's just all about what team you're playing in and I feel like he's a bit more of a leader than Messi is so like Messi, Messi, like you'd give you give Messi the captaincy because like you respect him as a player, like he's unreal, right? But I think because of a, his achievements, and yeah. Like, but as a as a leader, I think Ronaldo, hundred yeah. percent. And in a team like say Man United, you kind of need that leader. But wherever Messi goes, even PSG, he's got like Mbappe, Neymar, like world class around him. Yeah. So I don't know, like so, as a as a footballer, I think yeah. Messi's technique, passing, vision, whatever, like yeah. way better than Ronaldo. But who would you rather have in your team? I think Ronaldo. 100%. I, I agree. What you've said, it, it's so hard to explain to some Messi fans, obviously. They love football from, I guess, from that angle of like, you know, probably similar fan, fans to um, other playmakers. Um, like Maradona fans are usually Messi fans, you know, kind of thing. But yeah. For the same reason, I would 100% have CR7 on the team over Messi. Mm. You need if you don't score goals, you don't win. And yeah, exactly. That's that's what he creates for it for you, obviously. And um, if you could, like you know, play for any club in the world, if you had the choice, you wanted to be on the roster and you could play, and you know you could you could hang with them and you just ha have a good time and play with it. What team would that be? Uh, it'd probably be... You go to your peak, pick a team, or even now, like, whatever, like, what club? Do you have a club, by the way? Yeah, nah, not really. Not really? Nah. I, I actually one. don't have a club. I don't I don't support a football club. I, I like players. All but... right, so to answer your first question, I think it'd probably be, like, that Fergie era of Man United. Yeah. Like, say, like, young Ronaldo, Rooney... Like maybe that team, yeah. Or even when Beckham was there, or like Real Madrid when Beckham moved, and he had like the other Ronaldo and like Zidane and all that. Those are like for me my favorite teams. I think. Yeah. Um. So Man U will be the team that era. Yeah. So because I was growing up in New Zealand, yeah. like football's never on TV. Yeah. So you never watched it. You just played it. You have right? to stream it. Yeah. <laughs> stream. Like <laughs> didn't have streaming back then. Oh, that's true. <laughs> what? Did, how did we, how did people watch football back then? You need Sky, I think. And even then, like, well, we didn't have Sky when I was growing up, but, like, even then, it was hardly on, right? Yeah. Um, so watching it never really – I don't really care about watching it, right? I, I enjoyed playing rather than watching. So I think even in my older years, I, I hardly ever watched. I, I've only actually really started watching football now. Is it because you played so much of it so you didn't really watch it? Or is it because yeah. is, is that the reason? Yeah, pr probably. Yeah. I'd watch highlights, like, yeah. you know, clips and just yeah. goals and, like, just, you know, watch players or what they do. But, like, I never sat down and watched the whole game yeah. unless it was a massive, massive game, you yeah. know. Like World Cup finals and... So that's why I never really yeah. followed a team. I'd follow players more. Same, 100%. Same. I'm, I'm exactly the same when people say, what's your team? Uh, I don't have a team because players keep changing, right? You like players the way they play, who they are, um, and everything like that. So that's the same reason I don't have a team. Yeah. But if you would play in a team, it would be Man United in that era of, uh, you know. Yeah, I think because like that's when I was kind of growing up as well, yeah. and I that, that would be my favorite team when I was growing up. Yeah, you know, like after Fergie left, that's a whole completely different Man United. Yeah, right. So I haven't really watched, or I haven't really watched Man United, but. Um, a good friend of mine, Kagawa, he, I played with him in, in Japan and then he went to Borussia Dortmund 
And so I'd kind of follow him, right? Like, mm. like so I started watching heaps of Dortmund. That's when Klopp was there. And it was just unreal, like Aubameyang, yeah, like yep. Klopp. And so that was really good. And I was actually lucky enough to go, oh, sorry, before that. Then he went to Man United. So that's when I started watching Man United because I was watching him. Right? Yeah. And yeah, he was playing with like Rooney and like it was, and he did all right there. And then that's when Alex Ferguson left and then Moyes came in and then Shinji didn't get enough game time. So he went back to Dortmund. Yeah. And while he was at Man United, so they do something really cool with their foreign players to make them like feel more so they don't get homesick. They invite family members or they invite friends like all paid for. Nice. To come stay. That's, that's a good with Players and stuff yeah. like that, right? So. So the players wouldn't like, get homesick and leave. Yeah. Right. So that's called investment, man. Yeah. So well, to them, it's pocket change. Yeah. But it's good. It's smart. And um, Shinji actually called me and said, like, you want to come? I was like, 100%, you know? Yeah. Um, but I was mid season. There's just no way. Like, if I was here, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd be gone tomorrow. But like, because yeah. I was on, under contract and, you know, like, um, so I had to say no, but he had a four-year contract at Man United. So I'm like, oh, one day I'll go. And then after two years, he went back to Germany. I was like, no, you know, like, so while he's at Germany, he goes, oh, do you want to come over? And um, because I was playing in Thailand, the seasons are different. So my mid my off season was like his mid season. Yeah. So bang, first plane I went there because I was like, no way, I'm gonna lose this opportunity to go like be in an environment like that. Yeah. So I stayed with him for two weeks and went to a few games there. So the first game I went to was Bayern versus Dortmund. Yeah. Like 80,000 at, um, what's it called? Signa, I don't know, the stadium the at Borussia Dortmund. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unreal. It was unbelievable. And um, Signa Dune or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was really, really cool. So they played Bayern. And then the next game was a Champions League game. And Shinji played in that and he scored, he scored two goals. Nice. And that was uh, Michael, Michael Royce. He, he just came back from injury and, like, he played in that game and scored a hat-trick. Yeah. And, yeah, I was like, Shinji, just grab me anyone shirt. I don't care who, like, you know. Like, and I was like, when he played Bayern, I was like, try and get me, like, uh, Lewandowski shirt. Yeah. Because you know, he was playing for Bayern. Couldn't get it. So I ended up walking away with Michael Royce's match-worn jersey. Yeah. They scored a hat-trick in. Uh, Mario Gutz's shirt and Aubameyang's shirt. Nice. Yeah, and then the next day... He you took, still have them? Yeah, and the next yeah. day he took them in training and um, got them signed and I got them framed up on the wall. Nice. Oh, they're on the wall now, the store. What the other garage. shirts do you have to your collection? Um, I got a pair of signed Mario Balotelli boots. Like all customized, like to his foot, you know, like yeah, yeah. real different to the ones you buy in the store. Um, yeah, I've got. How did you get that? Uh, through an ex teammate of mine who's like best mates with him. And that's how I, offside is, is nice. over there as well. I see, I see. Yeah, so a pair of boots from him. I've got Shinji's Dortmund shirt, Japan national team shirt. I've got Michael Royce, good to. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a few. <laughs> nice. And uh, what other, like, top-level players have you played with uh, in your career that are, like, well, you know, still maybe playing or played at, like, the highest clubs? I think played with, like, Shinji would be the so, top. Yeah. Um, that's pretty impressive. So, like, he won the Japanese league his final season there. Yeah. Then he went to Dortmund, won that league. Then he went to no, won the league there, won the league again, and then he went to United and won the league there. So he won four titles in four years. Four seasons. Four seasons. That's that, crazy. Unreal, eh? And um, so, yeah, he'd be number one. It's weird because I played in Asia. There's, like, no one here kind of knows the players I played with. Yeah. Even though they're, like, top, top class. Yeah. Or played against. So, like, one player I would say I've played against would be Hulk. Yeah, I know. The, the yeah, Brazilian, Brazilian Hulk. Hulk, yeah. That's just maybe someone that people, the people would know. Here would yeah. know. Um, there was a player, Shinji Ono, he, he he did a little stint at Western Wanderers um, at the end of his career. Yeah. But he was unreal as well. 
Brazilian Brazilian players get paid real well. I think when we're doing some research, um, they get paid real well in Japan, eh? The, Bra- yep. the, the guys that come over from Brazil. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they get paid real well. Yeah, I was, I was so Hulk started there. Yeah. So he was like a little puppy and he did really well there, but he was still massive. So I was yeah. like 18, he was 20 and he was the same size as he is now. Yeah. And then, then he went off to Porto and made the career he did. Yeah. But um, yeah, Brazilian players get paid well everywhere, I think, just because they got the name, like Brazilian. <laughs> Honestly, like the amount of teams I've played for and like you get these Brazilian guys coming on trial yeah. and like... That guy's making it. I'm like, but you're shit. <laughs> <laughs> you're supposed to be good, you know? Like, And there's a lot of players that milk it just because they are Brazilian, Brazilian, you know? They get the contract first and then yeah. they end up being like, not very good and yeah. get asked to leave or pay it out and yeah it's quite funny I think actually there was a but the good ones are really good the, the, there was actually a Brazilian I think it was from Brazil there was a guy that um, fooled I think he signed for Aston Villa I'm just trying to think he actually yeah got I a, think I know that one that, yeah I think he was from Brazil wasn't he that guy I, yeah yeah, but I know a player I think even Man United signed it. one he faked it like he didn't never played like um, anything properly he just used somebody's uh, footage that look, it was a lookalike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he made it all the way to like a top league. It could have even been Man United. They signed someone what, and it was just like, yeah, shambles. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember what club it was, but it was crazy that he got through everything and he never played a game because he was always injured apparently. Yeah. And until they discovered that this guy is actually really crap. Smart. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so I, a couple of other players I played with, like um, another Brazilian guy, but this guy was unreal. So like he 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 played with Neymar in the under twenties, wow. under twenties, or or in a club team Santos or something like that. Yeah. Um, in Brazil, then he went to Olympiacos and he was number ten for Olympiacos, and then he came to uh, my team in Thailand, and like yeah, he was proper good, and now he's making millions a year like in Thailand. Yeah. Um, but he was really really good yeah. and. I've also played uh, same team center back. He um, he used to play for Celta Vigo in Spain, and he's telling me stories like uh, he went to. So he's played against Messi. He's played against Ronaldo. He's played against Aguero. Like when Aguero was at Atletico Madrid, yeah. And he was telling me these stories about when he played around Madrid at the Bernabeu, and he's just like the Bernabeu is just like it's just like that. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's just, you just look up at the stands. It's unreal. And then he's like, oh, like they had a game plan of like playing out from the back. So there's a goal kick, played out from the back, gets the ball from the keeper, and he like turns out, looks up, and he's got Gareth Bale like sprinting at him. Looks straight ahead. He's got a Ben's a mass sprinting. He's looking over there. He's got Ronaldo like sprinting over there, and he goes, nah, fuck. <laughs> just boots the ball off the pitch. But he's just telling me all these stories like that. And that he's actually um. He's the one who told me, just personality-wise, like he said Ronaldo's like a top top dude like on the pitch, you know, like he'll help you up or, you know, like just a nice dude. But he said Messi, he is like real nasty, like he's quite like, dirty. Real like, arrogant. I guess so. But like yeah. he, yeah, he'd, he'd be the one like cursing like your mom and like, you know, oh, like he, he'd be – It'd be a bit of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like, what? But you don't see that, right? Yeah. So that was quite interesting. Wow. And like with with these top guys that you've played with or had in contact with, um, out of that, how many, like, are they same, like, age bracket or the younger guys, older guys, like, are they still playing? Um, What was uh, the guy that you played in Thailand with? Um, Can't say his name. Uh, The one that played for Bayern, played in Manchester. Oh, Kagawa. K- Kagawa. Uh, played with them in Japan. Yeah. Is he still playing? Yeah, he's, so he's playing in Belgium, I think, at the moment. He's playing in Belgium at the moment. Yeah, so like towards How old is he? He's the same age as me. He's 30, he'd be 33, I think. So he's, um, yeah, towards the end of his career, I think he's just started bouncing around. Yep. Like lower leagues and stuff like that. Yep. But yeah, like in his prime, he was he was getting interest from like Barcelona, Real Madrid. and Wow. Like before he moved to Man United, it's yeah. kind of like, which one do I choose? Well, imagine being in that spot, man. Like you gotta choose from. I mean, he he did well at Man U. Mm. He's so. the first Asian player to score a hat trick. Wow, that's, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy, man. And with with everything now slowing down for you, 
a lot of it. You know, you've got time for the family, you've got time for the wife, you've got time for offside now and everything like that. What area do you want to now develop in apart from football, offside or whatever it is? Um, like something that maybe you didn't get to do uh, apart from family that you can really spend time with and everything now. Like what area do you want to, since everything's slowed down now, what area do you want to develop in? A new skill that you want to learn or anything like that that you always wanted to do before? Before like you could because of football? I think everything I wanted to do was like, I don't know, required a uh, young age. You know yeah. what I mean? So, oh, really? So if it wasn't football, I think it w- I would have tried out tennis. Tennis. You know what I mean? Like so, um, it was always either going to be football or tennis. Football or tennis. So I was gonna. So I chose football. Yeah. I don't know why, but um, I was so probably you, better at football than tennis. Yeah. Do you and play a bit of tennis nowadays? No, I haven't picked up a racket in years. But yeah, I was I was okay. I was I was alright. I was in the Auckland rep team and stuff like that growing yeah. up. So. I was actually coached by Zoro's brother. Really? Yeah, he's a tennis coach. Oh, wow. <laughs> so now, um, now Zoro's coaching you for football. Yeah. <laughs> it was just Man. meant to be. Yeah, I feel old, eh? Like, she's been around. But, um, wow. But yeah, obviously, you can't pick that up now and, like, try and make it to the top. It's just too late. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. I mean, Roger's 40, man. <laughs> Roger's Roger. <laughs> <laughs> no, with, um, with that being said, bro, like it, it's, it's it was, a hard question. Like it, I never thought about it, you know. So that's yeah. why now just my f- focus is on the family. On family, so. that's fair enough. I was just gonna say, with that being said, like you've already probably done enough of sport to be honest. Like you know, for fifteen years or so, you'd say over fifteen years. Well, I mean, yeah, if you start, if you yeah, can, from when you wanted to play, right? Yeah, but pro, I was fourteen years. Fourteen years, pro. Yeah, I think you've done a lot of sport already, man. So. Yeah. Not anything else like not sport related? Like something like real odd, like cooking, you wanted to. No, no chance. No chance. <laughs> <laughs> I do we got the old uh what was it Hello Fresh or whatever. Yeah. So you cook them up, is it? Yeah, sometimes I'll leave my wife with those duties and yeah. step in and Yeah. Those are pretty easy to follow along, right? They I, are right. Yeah, yeah, you'd be surprised. Yeah, I assist my Still wife. Managed to, too. Mess it up sometimes. <laughs> no, nah, they're, they're good, eh? Yeah. But, uh, but now it forces me to do something I'm not really good at, so that's cool. But no, nah, that's a good one. I might walk away from this and actually think about it, but not really faster to be fair right now. Yeah. But I might choose something like t- uh, my last contract in Thailand is actually like I was sporting director. That was my last gig in Thailand. Yeah. Um, so I went down to the third division club and – I had like a five-year contract where I was going to play for two and then step away and do the sporting, sporting director. Yeah. And But I actually started on like day one. Yeah. So did the club philosophy and it was pretty much like real life uh, football manager, right? So like yeah. bought players, sold players, like hired staff, picked the coach, you know, built a gym in our facility, like really just like this is how we're going to play, you know? Wow. And So how long did you do that for then? I lost uh, it was about 18 months before I had to come home yeah so yeah. you were doing that and playing yeah that's actually okay. for that team uh, Bangkok FC uh, so I, I designed that kit myself nice nice man yeah so that was really enjoyable but I just can't do it here like you know there's no real opportunity no to do opportunity. it like that like because all the clubs are amateur, so you, there's just so many different things to think about. Yeah. Whereas if you just focus to it's like a football professional business where you have to try and make money for the club to like you know self sustain, like keep yeah self sustainable. How are you gonna do this? Like sponsors and all that. Like yeah. it's really fun. And uh, another thing over here is the funds as well, right? You yeah, you just don't. It's no, just not. No funds. It's, it's hard. Yeah. It's like, really hard. Me and me and one of my mates were actually. Funny thing, we've actually n- haven't spoken to anyone about this yet. Just a few uh, big sponsors that we've like um, sort of attracted to the idea of doing this, and they're on board with like kind of working with us. And he's working with me on this project. Uh, it's to do with football. It cool. is uh, next year. We're planning to do like a big fund fundraiser um, event, which is a football match essentially. Uh, so we're trying to we're trying to get um, a lot of like international ex 
football players to come play uh, into like sort of um, NZ versus the rest of the world sort of thing. Oh, yeah, cool. So like we're trying to do one of those over here. We're looking at like Mount Smart as one of the probably potential locations to do that. So like a playing 11 or 15 or whatever is going to be from New Zealand versus like some of the international talent that will come make the team. It's a big project, So, but it's all for charity though. Yeah, cool. So no one's really... Oh, like, I might know a few players that might want to come down. So that'd be that'd be interesting. Yeah, I've played against them. Um, there's a lot of people, a lot of players that come from Europe and they, they want to end in Asia because like Europe you get raped with tax. You know, like fifty percent, forty percent tax. Whereas in Asia, it's all net, right? So, like, whatever contract you agree on, like, you get all of it. There's no tax. Well, the club pays all that stuff, so like, you don't have to worry about that. Right. So, whatever's on your papers, it's what you get. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you sign for a dollar, you get that dollar. You don't have to take that dollar and yeah, yeah, give yeah. away half of it to you know. Wow. So, a lot of the European players, they kind of try and come to Asia towards the end of their career and make bank and then, you know, try and go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we've had heaps of players come to, uh, before my time, Robbie Fowler from Liverpool came to Thailand, did a little stint then. Yeah. Um, There's another uh, English player, Jay Bothroyd, he, he came over. Uh, Cinema Pongo, he used to play for Liverpool. Mm. French player. Played against him a couple of times. Really nice dude, actually. Yeah. That's a player that you might want to bring over for your little charity match. Yeah. Cinema Pongo. I mean, you could... So they're all obviously retired, right? Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, that could... We could even have Zorro and you in there <laughs> playing, playing together for New Zealand. Oh. So it, it's going to be like... Um, it's going to be like some probably potentially like other people, like influences and thing in there too. Like we're looking at a couple of like TV people. Yeah, cool. Keep we'll, it fun. So yeah. just making that fun. So it's not going to be like all too serious. It's just like... Yeah. A good fun charity match, but yeah. Oh, that's cool, man. I hope that works out. So that in saying that good fun, Chris might get serious. I'm actually trying to get Chris to come on a, onto a podcast as well, but that guy's such a busy man <laughs> that um he's got stories for days. I like oh, I really like that guy. Would. Yeah, he's 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 he also had a good career, right? So yeah. he'd definitely have some stories. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on to tomorrow, you're playing a game against uh at the time of filming this podcast, obviously you're playing a game tomorrow against uh, Manukau United. Yep. Uh, you so you're you're starting tomorrow. How do you guys like? Do you guys get the? How does it work over here? Do you guys get like early uh, on or on the day? Day before. Day before. So I don't know yet, but oh, they're gonna tell you later on. Yeah. Right. I see. Cool. And how's this season going for you in New Zealand over here so far? How many goals then are you? How sorry uh, for me or for for you for you personally? Oh, it's been a slow season for me yeah um, I don't know it's just a weird one like just sickness uh, injuries you know yeah. I, just, I just haven't been I don't know been able to tick yet yeah I mean, it's almost the end of the season so it's just maybe one of those write off seasons that you have I see um, and w what is, uh, talking about injuries actually one question I completely forgot to ask you yeah. was in that mix was Injuries during your career, like the worst to sort of, like what's the reoccurring one and what's the worst one you've actually had, if you uh, had any reoccurring? I've been actually quite lucky. Like you, you, you hear about players who have like career-ending injuries and stuff like that or like knees, ACLs or like the typical yep. ones. Yep. I haven't had that. So the worst one I had was a PCL little tear in the PCL which healed itself after six months so I was out for six months yeah. but no surgery no nothing yeah um yeah I'm more like hamstrings I hamstring think. yeah because I was I was more of a sprinter yeah. you know so yeah just hamstrings like pop 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 so, yeah so my worst season I think I had like nine separate injuries which was like what hamstring related or separate like separate separate, 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 separate. So like, okay. because because when you're playing as a foreign player in the team. So this was when I went to Thailand, right? So you get paid paid the best. You have to play every game, you know, like you guarantee games that you – but you got to be at your top level. So when you're injured for too long, they kind of force you back, right? So like what's taking so long? Oh, oh, my God, oh no, I'm at 80%. Oh, that's good enough, like play. Mm. So that's when you pick up other injuries because you're not fully ready to come yeah. back. 
Um, so, and that was actually right about the time, like when I just got first caught up into the All Whites. Um, so that was at the end of 2014, I think. And then like that whole 2015, I was I was injured. Not to say like I was going to get selected again, but even if I did, I, I couldn't. Yeah. You know, because I was just, I was out. I think I only played about six or seven games that year. Six or seven games? The wow. whole season. There's what, like what was the injury? Available. What was the main injury? I would be from, I had, I broke a little bone in my foot or my toe or something like that to hamstring to hip to this and that. Like, it was just, it was crazy. Right. And and how's the body holding up now after 14 years of playing? Injury-wise, fine. Just, just yeah. a bit heavy. <laughs> just a bit <laughs> <laughs> when you said you picked up a bit oh, over, over the lockdowns, not even just since since I stopped playing, I think I'm like ten kgs heavier than like my weight I was playing pro. Well, you're ten kgs heavier from then. Maybe not then. Maybe five, but yeah, yeah. Let's but. have a look at some other. No, because I saw before and after when we were just having a look at your Instagram. If you scroll up, um, look at that. When's when's that? What's Oh, then and now. I thought it was before and after. So that photo that's, there. That's when I was playing and that's when I stopped. <laughs> that's like me now. Oh, <laughs> my bad. I, I thought it was a before and after. I'm like, are oh, you transformed? Yeah. Uh, okay. I, so did, I did the opposite there. Then and now. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, what else, man? What else is it that you want to sort of like share from your career that you feel that will be really um, helpful to people playing now, young talents playing now? Like... You're on the pitch, like training, in your training currently where you are, and you see all these young kids, they say they want to play pro. If you could be uncensored, what would you say to them? Like, I reckon, like, this is something. Because th there's some things that you can't, like, it's not, how you say it, it's not correct or politically correct to say nowadays anymore. Like, you can't say things to people no more sort of thing, you know? Like back in the days, I think like obviously like Chris was telling me, you could just tell people as it is and you have to get on with it and just do it. Like this is from, you know, Chris's time. Yeah. So like nowadays. That, that's kind of why I like working with Chris. Because. Mm. Me too. I mean, you know, in New Zealand, whether it's amateur or pro, it's still the highest level. So like get told, like, you know, like if you, if it needs to be told, you tell them. Yeah. Um, But even me, like when I was playing for my teams over there, like I could rip into a player, you know, like, but here I just feel like it's, I want to, but I don't, you know, like, and maybe that's not really good on my behalf. Yeah. But yeah, like you say, it's, it's just that viable, that environment that it's, it is here. It's, it is amateur. Yeah. You know? And, um, but something I've really noticed like during my time or my career is, how do I say this? It's just be ready. You know, like it's all about, and this this goes not just football, but like life as well. It's just, it's all about opportunities and like taking opportunities. So like you'll talk just to anyone and they'll be like, oh, I've never had the chance to do that or I never got that opportunity or I never did that, did that. But opportunity is a funny thing. It comes in like different shapes and forms and like different times. And sometimes you didn't even know that was an opportunity, but because you physically or personally or mentally or whatever weren't ready, like that you didn't even think that was an opportunity or you didn't take that opportunity to progress or go down a different path, yeah. right? So, and then that's when excuses happen because like, that's the easiest thing to do is just chuck in an excuse or this, 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 you know? But like if you were ready, like, and I, and I learned that really early on. So like, for example, a cross comes in and, and you miss a header or a shot and, it, you know, but, if I scored that goal, who knows who's watching, right? I yeah. could it could have end it could have led to another uh, another contract or an extension or this or that. But because I missed that, it went the other way, and yes. you know, like you know, yeah. so that's just a real simple example. Or um, so there would just be those moments in games where like I miss or I make a mistake, so then. How do I fix that? I gotta be ready for next time that exact situation happens or this cross comes in, I'm definitely gonna score. So I'd always be ready, as in like after training, I'd stay behind, extra shooting, this, 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 this angle, that angle, this right, left, you know, it yeah. is.
get a coach to stay behind and like whip balls in or get another winger or something like yeah help me out here by helping you out as well because you're getting better at crossing yeah um yeah or just even like not football like financially like if you don't have the funds to a good investment or a good opportunity comes up or you know but you don't have the funds you can't take that opportunity right yes you can't but if you had if you if you stuck to like a savings plan or you were good at saving or you just you know you had that pocket of cash or something to jump on that opportunity yeah because you were ready and i think like um opportunity gets created when you have structure to what you're trying to accomplish right Mm -hmm. that's when you actually start seeing those opportunities as well so like with with these young players coming up and playing now um I think a lot of them lack a lot of structure and planning in what they actually need to do to what they think that they need to do. Their thinking of what needs to be done is completely different to what the actual is. Yeah, but they've got no idea. Exactly. So they think here, for here, tw- twice a week training is good enough because then you got a game in the weekend, right? And that's it, yeah. Right. And But say a scout comes to one of these games and they, they're looking for anyone to go pro, you think you train twice a week and then playing a good game on the weekend, like that's enough, to, you know, like yeah. that's your opportunity there, the guy watching you. But because you only train twice a week, you're not going to be good enough to what what he's looking for. Yeah. But if you trained every day, you know, you might be better than you are or you might take that opportunity in front of goal that might make him, make him go, oh yeah, we'll give him a chance. But once you do go pro and you jump to pro, they train twice a day, not twice a week. Yeah. And that was the biggest culture shock for me. Like I was morning and afternoon. I was I was yeah. young. I was like you know I straight out of high school. I was young yeah. and I was training like twice a day. And ugh, mate, I couldn't walk. Yeah. Like my first week at, at training, I was I couldn't walk. Like ice packs. I, I I don't have a photo, but like I took one. I had ice packs on my calves, both calves, hammies, quads. Like it was just I was just ice, right? Yeah. Just all strapped to me, like just recovery. Like I, I was fucked. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly um, what one of my friends said. Actually, what you said, a scout could be watching. He actually got scouted to go to the Barcelona Academy mm. in Barcelona, one of the one of those academies in Barcelona. Yeah. Uh, and guess where he got scouted at futsal. Oh yeah, cool. And um, the guy got tired of the, well, the scout that came to New Zealand got tired of going to games and he couldn't find like the young player that he was looking for. So his, his task was to find one from North Island and one from South Island. Yeah. So he was here from Barcelona to do that. Yeah. And um, he's like, you know what? I'm tired of going to the actual like live inside games. Yeah. Let's go have a look at maybe haven't seen. So he started going to indoor games. And this is one of my mates that went there, spent a year in Barcelona training and everything. And he did an ACL. He had to come back. He got his surgery done and everything like that. And then he went, before going back to playing for his club in Barcelona again, he's only 16, 17 at that time, right? So he's like, okay, he'll he'll just have some warm-up games over here. And the first game back, he did ACL again. But then he said the exact same thing, what you just said. It was the biggest shock for him, A, for saying yes to going to Barcelona. All they did was this train. So like uh, injury prevention in the morning. Uh, a training session at late morning and then in late afternoon they had another proper training session and he said that same thing what you said just ice bath every night every night like he would be in the ice because he was the biggest culture shock and how are you supposed to compete with that when you're here just having fun like fun is the main focus right from yeah. when you start all the way up to late teens oh you gotta be having fun how are you supposed to compete with that you got mm-hmm. kids over there training two three times a day no chance. No chance. You know what I mean? So <laughs> it's just full circle, really. But And then what What about... Um, but also know, to that point, like, okay, ACLs and stuff, that's freak accident, right? Like, yeah. But not to be harsh, but like was if he was in the gym, was he in the gym? Like, that's my question. Like, that, was I he in know. the gym? Yeah. Was he making those like muscles around the knees like strong? Mm. That's what I'm talking about, like the opportunity, you know, like be ready, like... That season, I had all those injuries. I wasn't. I was. I, I'll be fair. Like, it's so easy to kind of get ahead of yourself in football. Like after a good season, you kind of think you're the man or whatever. You know, like yeah. so you take it. It's real easy to just take your foot off the pedal because everything's going really well. Yeah. But then I was just getting injury after injury after injury, and I wasn't looking after. And I was really trying to think back because I wasn't in the gym. Like I slacked off there, or you know, mm. I wasn't ready. But if I if I was, maybe when that all whites call up did come, 
I'm, I'm there, you know, because I'm ready. Yeah. But no, nah, <laughs> I wasn't, right? So that opportunity, I missed that opportunity. Oh, well, the opportunity never came. Yeah. But another one was when I actually did get selected to the All Whites. Like I wasn't in my best condition when I went to the All Whites. What Either. You like you weren't fit? Or? So like I just finished my season. Yeah. Then I went on, I had a break. I went on holiday. I actually went on my honeymoon. And then I went to the All Whites, right? Yeah. Instead of being like, yo, I can hold off on the honeymoon maybe. Oh, Keep man, that's trouble. Yeah, but, but like yeah. we'd already delayed the honeymoon because we got married mid-season. Yeah. So we did the honeymoon at the end of the year. So like, you know what I mean? But like always, like that national team call up, that's rare or not not the sum, but like for me it was, you know, so I was like, oh, maybe if I just trained all the way through and went to the all-white camp like tip top, yeah. I could have done maybe better when I came on, you know, which yeah. could have made a longer season, a longer career playing for New Zealand instead of the one I've, I had. Yeah. You know, like so – like I hear it all the time, like I never had the chance or I never had the opportunity, but I bet you you did, but you weren't ready or you weren't, you know, like in a position. Or mentally you weren't just went. there, yeah. So that would be my mass, my main advice is yeah. just, even if like there is no goal, just whatever you're doing, just just be the best, right? Yeah, so what doing. whatever comes, you're like, oh yeah, sweet, I can do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's that's great, man. But yeah, I don't know if that guy was actually working out of the gym. I don't I'm know not. I'm not. Yeah, yeah maybe yeah, he was. You know, and he yeah. could still do an ACL. Yeah, still so an ACL. Just, but I don't know. But he did say though what you said. It was that after two weeks of being there, he was actually contemplating if it was in the right place or not because everybody he felt was so much more better than him, and he felt like everybody was no one else around him was sore. It was just him. It was just seeing himself as like, man, why am I the only sore one? But for two after the first two weeks, he wanted to get on the plane and come back. But then it was like he'll never get opportunity like this to come to a like one of the I can't remember what Barcelona Academy he said, but it was one of the big Barcelona academies over there that he got to put in. Yeah, um, it was really cool from what he explained. Like if you didn't know uh, Spanish, uh, you'd go learn that, and if you didn't know English, you'd go learn that. So in between your football, you went to school as well to yeah, learn yeah, these yeah. languages and things one. like yeah. that. So it was really good the way he explained it. Um, he was actually, he like the times I've played with him after his injury, he was he was pretty decent too. Yeah. That guy, um, he's he's still young. He's only twenty three or twenty four. Okay. So what's his name? Uh, Karan. Karan. Yeah. So he had a pretty short career, you can say. Yeah. yeah unfortunately, say. it yeah. does happen. And. Um, that was, yeah, that was the end of his career, I guess. But no, nah, thank you so much for um, coming on, man. Is there anything else that you wanted to cover sort of this podcast that you want to leave us with? Um, it's been quite nice to get a view from a pro footballer that's been there, done that, come gone overseas and now come back. And it's like sort of, it's, it's a very interesting one where you've, you know, now transitioning into what you said. It's sort of an inter interesting period you get to do family things, you get to do kid stuff. Um, and now you're coaching too. I mean, there's like lots of things that you can do. Why didn't you take up the captaincy too of uh, Western Springs when you had the opportunity? Or oh, no. Do you have to kind of put your hand up? How does that work? Uh, to be fair, <laughs> it doesn't really bother me. Like Josh is more suited for that role anyway. Right, but, I um, see. Yeah, like he's been there longer as well. Oh, true, true. Is that, is that like... How long? How many seasons has he spent there? I'm not so sure. Four or five, mm. I think. But I um, he was vice captain. Oh, okay. So usually when the captain leaves, you know, oh, he was there. vice already. So who's the vice captain now? I don't know. I think maybe me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you better not check that unofficially. Man. Me. Yeah. <laughs> unofficially. Yeah, not so sure. Well, no, that's good, man. So yeah, if there's if there's um anything else that you want to leave us with, man. Like, let us know. Um, By the way, I know I didn't say this at the start of the podcast, but we will uh, put your um, Instagram right at the top uh, of the of the video version of it. But I didn't say it. What your your it is uh, Kane Vincent underscore eleven actually, which I generally say this at the start of the podcast. But I was just so excited to start chatting with you that completely missed my. Skip my mind. K 
Kane Vincent. That's K-A-Y-N-E-V-I-N-C-E-N-T underscore Levin. Why Levin? Is that the, was that your playing number all the time? When I when I had the opportunity to get a Levin, I'd be a Levin, yeah. Right, okay. Are you Levin now? No. <laughs> Who wears Levin? Oscar Brown. Oh, right. But right. I think like we go by shirt sizes. Shirt so. sizes? Yeah. So is like, it? so I think nine is the largest, so they give it to me, you know? Like, is the largest? Yeah, because it's not, it's not personalized. Right, okay. Right, like the, these, like you get your number, you get your name on it. All oh, right, it's your yours. size. They're yours, yeah. right? But yeah. like you come into a club here, there's no name on the back. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's kind of like they print them all first, like yeah. based on kind of positions or sizes, right? So yeah. nine is a, uh, a large, let's say, and then 11 might be a medium, right? Yeah. So there's no way I could be an 11. Yeah, like, unless, I see. Unless, yeah. But I think that's why I got nine. Or that was the only available number at the time. So that's what it is, man. It's not. It's it's the number thing. If you got to get the eleven back to be be, you know. Well, I had my first. I had my worst ever season wearing number nine. So. <laughs> <laughs> so who? Oh, so I guess the the club decides, right? They just give out the jerseys. I guess. Yeah, to be fair, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, it doesn't really bother me anymore. Anymore. It used to be a thing, eh? Oh, mate, I was I was bad. If I don't score in the first half, I change my boots for the second half. Like, it was, it was, I was bad. Like, yeah, I th- I think I'm like real thing. Like, I mean, obviously, I didn't play at the level that you did, or nowhere close to it. But even now, like, I'm really like, I have my boots, have the socks. Okay, it has to go with those boots because the inners. Like, I'm very like detailed about what I do. It, like, has to be spot on. Then I feel good playing. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Like, I was always like that as well. Like, like what? Oh, yeah. I just thought I was weird out of the team because obviously, you know, nobody like really cares as much, but I'd be like, okay, I got to have my, like, even before you came in here, I was like, okay, I got to have, which I wonder what you want this guy will drink. So I'll just get both of the options, you know? So I got to have the same thing for me on game day. So like I have my water, got to have my energy drink, got to have my hydration drink. Like yeah. it has to be like all set. Then I know I'm in the right mind of playing. Yeah. Like whatever makes you comfortable, right? Yeah. To perform to your best. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess like nutrition is a huge part of uh, what I do even now, um, being in the gym, being an athlete, because obviously for what I do, it's how you look of what you eat and what do you think. So and I think it hugely impacts in a lot of other sports too. Like nowadays, I think like in pro football, um, like food and everything obviously comes with the, the job, right? You have to eat what they kind of recommend you nowadays. It's like heavily, heavily imposed now overseas. So th- thank you so much, Kane, once again, for agreeing to come, sharing your knowledge, and I hope a young player listening to this can take a lot out of it. Actually, a couple of players have contacted me recently, like I said, from multiple sports to be their agent, and that's why we are going to to the agency. Yeah, you were saying. Yes, I was saying. So, yeah. so if people listening, the career that Kane's had, I um, hope you took something good away from it. And uh, thank you so much for coming onto the show and speaking with us, man. And any last words that you want to say? No, it was a pleasure. Like it's my first podcast, so I had really uh, had fun, mate. It's really good. Yep. So thank you for having me. No problem, man. Video version up on YouTube, audio version up on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. Thank you so much, Kane. No, cheers, pleasure, mate. Thank you. And we'll catch you guys on the next one.